So then you went to uh, chapter six, which was uh, sharing emotions. And yes. I think that was part of your research too. I mean, in, in Italy, I mean, when they discovered neurons, it was all about motor, the motor exactly. neurons. And you actually made the transition from motor neurons to um, the feeling and emotions. Exactly. Yeah, so, so, so in, the, in the monkey, the, the whole thing started because the team in Parma was interested in understanding the motor system. So they had a clear interest in the motor system. And then they understood that while we see the actions of others, we map it onto our own actions. But I think that if you take anyone in the street and ask them what empathy is about, very few of them would tell kind of that um, empathy is doing what you see other people do. Most people would say that empathy is about feeling what other people feel. And, and so there we were, kind of understanding how you map actions of others onto your own actions. And at the same time, everybody thinking that empathy is mainly about emotions. So basically, what, what I then did was trying to take, uh, together with colleagues of mine, this notion that we understood well in terms of the brain of, of mirror neurons for actions and test whether it might uh, work for emotions as well. And, and you can imagine one of the big challenges to study emotions is actually to, to induce them in human beings while you can study what happens in the brain. So I can put you in a scanner and tell you to be happy for 10 seconds, but it's not going to work very well. So, so what we did was we put people in a scanner and put an anesthesia mask on their face and ask you, why do I get an anesthesia mask? And, and you tell them, well, just wait a bit, you're going to find out soon enough. And, and, and then what we did was we showed them first movies in which they'd see someone sniff at the glass and either reacting disgusted or, for instance, reacting pleased about the drink. So, so now for you, it's very easy to know which of these two cups of coffee you'd rather drink afterwards. But how does it happen in the brain? And, and that's when they find out why they have this anesthesia mask. Because we now start to puff either very pleasant smells in there. And they figure, gee, this is not too bad. Or we switch to, to something really disgusting, which is butyric acid or fulfora marketan that smells like rotten eggs. And, and one of our subjects started vomiting, so we had to take him out of the scanner. Mm -hmm. But for the, the others, we could now measure what the brain looks like while it's really being disgusted, and then what it looks like while it sees the disgust of somebody else. And for the first time, we could see that what we had seen in the motor system also applies to emotions. We could see that a part of the brain that we call the insula which is really responsible for allowing you to feel disgusted and, and giving you this urge to vomit, that this very embodied representation of your own emotions becomes active each time you see somebody else go through disgust. So, so then we really opened up this notion of mirroring from actions to emotions and suddenly saw that also when you see the emotions of others, you don't just activate representation of, of, of emotional facial expressions in your motor system, but you also associate this feeling of, of, of feeling sick to your own stomach that now allows you to go deeper than the skin. You no longer just see the disgusted facial expression, but you really feel what you would feel like in the same situation. Hmm. So it's, it's like tapping into your ex past experience of disgust, maybe a little nausea or, or kind of, exactly. and, and that's taking it down into the rest of your body and, um, Absolutely. and, and, and kind of spreading it, right? That's kind of like nausea exactly. is maybe a spreading uh, felt feelings through the whole body. I, I mean, this, this metaphor that people think is a metaphor of saying, gee, that uh, made me sick to my stomach is actually we can measure that almost. If you stimulate that part of the, the insula, you can measure that people's stomach is actually con constructing and, and, and is literally moving. So that we show that if you see the disgust of someone else, you don't just abstractly realize that person is disgusted. But it can go all the way into your body. It can start moving your own stomach in ways for you to share what goes on in the other in a very deep and embodied uh, way. 
And what I also describe in that uh, chapter is a very fascinating case of a patient that uh, because of a brain disease lost that part of his insula. And what you see is that this patient loses his own sense of disgust. So if you give him something really unpleasant to drink, he'll drink it and he's not going to feel any nausea. But the other thing is that if you show him a photo of a happy person, he can tell you that person is happy. But if you show him a photo of a disgusted person, because he lost his own sense of disgust, he's no longer able to really understand that somebody else is going through disgust. So it kind of deconstructs empathy in saying that the empathy is not this one brain function, but it's a mosaic of different things. And for the particular capacity to understand disgust in others, you need your own capacity of disgust. To understand the actions of others, you need a different brain region that's responsible for your own actions. So, so, so we really have this rich understanding of others because we have so many things that represent so many aspects of our own experiences. And each one of them can kind of resonate with what other people go through, creating this very rich, multi-model experience of really slipping into the skin of the other person. Well, it's so interesting how you're able to tease all this out, you know, with with kind of having to create experiments that, you know, take one factor and remove it and add another factor and you're able to kind of see kind of the mechanics of, and it kind of uh, makes you, you know, some people say that, well, mirror neurons aren't established fact yet or something like that. How, how do you kind of respond to that is? Well, that is, uh, the, 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 it, it always surprises me how little these people actually read because there in the, there are now in, in experiments in which in the epileptic patients, so if you, certain forms of epilepsy are so severe that no drug can cure it. And they then go to neurosurgeons like Itzhak Fried, for instance, in, the, in, the, in LA, to, to ask the surgeon to take out the part of the brain that is causing the epilepsy. And, and neurosurgeon like that, before just taking out the part, they put electrodes in these parts of the brain to really find out whether it really starts from there. And if they do that, you have the chance to, even in humans, record from single neurons. And by doing that, they were able to record from neurons in humans that uh, are active both when the human does an action like grasping a cup and while he sees somebody else grasp a cup. Or in, um, when people do a facial emotion facial expression or see the facial expression of others. So this came after the foundational work we did, of course, in, in monkeys. And for a while, it was just speculation. But by now, we have uh, absolute proof of the fact that humans have mirror neurons as well. So it's more kind of idle uh, talk rather <laughs> than actual fact. Well, in, in that chapter, you have uh, the... Uh which looks interesting is uh, the poker face uh, quality of which is I guess is hiding emotions like how does how does yes. that kind of work I mean that's kind of an interesting kind of an aspect of of mirror neurons is how are you actually kind of hiding your you exactly. know what's going on inside yourself so so they you have again just to think about the fact that of course mirror neurons are not magic. It's not like I can feel your emotions directly in any way. The, the only way that I can actually sense your emotions is because you make some kind of reaction to it, be it in the face or in the body. Now, this reaction, I can map onto my own motor system. I can kind of internally repeat what you've done. And then I know that when I do this, I have a certain emotion attached to that, so I can then decode that emotion I normally feel. So through your actual reactions, I can associate kind of these inner hidden states. Now, if you control your own facial expressions, of course, you, you deprive me of the very food that mirror neurons need to basically get to your inner feeling. And if you, 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 you're very good at it, you, you put up a complete uh, poker face, you, you don't show anything of what goes on in you, then you completely deprive me of the capacity to, to do that, of course. 
Yeah, so in terms of uh, deepening uh, uh, an empathic connection, that kind of shows the importance of revealing yourself. Absolutely. So that's that's really quite a beautiful, and that that that's, uh, ties into relationships too, right? In a couple, oh, if a couple want a deeper relationship, it's so important to reveal yourself so you have something for the other person to work with. And it, exactly. I mean, some some uh, in some couples, you get this thing where where one of the partners is really upset that the other partner never knows what present to give them for Christmas. Well, just make sure that the, the weeks before you, while you run in front of, uh, of the different stores, you, you really express how much you like certain things and how much you dislike some of the others. And then you'll see that your partner will become much more cunning. I think <laughs> it's really kind of a give and take. It's uh, like you say, I think that the accuracy of the connection between people has as much to do with the skills of the observer than with the skills of the sender. That the more clearly and unfilteredly you let your emotions come to the surface, the less lonely you'll feel because you, you give people now the capacity to, to really feel what goes on in you and, and, and react accurately to it. So, so, so like you say, it's, it's really something we, we need to, to deal with, is that the, the, the more we reveal our own emotions, actually, the more we connect to other people as well. Okay, that was uh, chapter six, um, and we have uh, chapter seven, sensation, seeing touch is literally touching, and why it hurts to damage your car, or a few of the... Yes. So, so here we've, uh, so we had actions in the beginning, then we, we went to emotions, and finally we went to, to sensations as well. And, and what we see is that if you just see somebody do something like I'm doing right now, you're actually activating part of your brain that are normally sensing touch on your own body. And if I slap this hand, you, you'll activate um, pain regions in, in your own brain. And what we see, strangely enough, is that if I replace this uh, hand with a, with a book, my, my book for that matter. <laughs> Conveniently. <laughs> it's a great book. <laughs> and, and, you, and I'm now showing you kind of something touching this book. You'll as well actually activate your own somatosensory cortex to some extent as if you'd be touched yourself. Kind of showing that it's not just the social world that we understand by empathy, but that we to some extent generalize that to the inanimate world as well. And that helps us understand in a way why sometimes kind of, for instance, seeing a car reverse and just scratch along a pole by mistake can kind of literally make yeah. you shiver a bit as if you, you, it'd be physically painful. It's kind of because we have such a strong mirror system, I think we use it as well to kind of feel and feel sorry about what happens to objects as well. And kind of understanding that kind of helps you understand as well why you sometimes have these irrational reactions to, 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 to your scratching your MacBook Pro or whatever you, you, you really like about, uh, about your own belongings. But I think that having that is, is as well important for, for culture because if we wouldn't care to kind of protect our objects, we, we, we wouldn't be able to, to build up the, the, the great kind of... Uh, at civilizations we have, where we have so many valuable tools as well. So it kind of, in a way, equips us not just to understand other people, but as well to be able to, to be caring about tools and objects that then become really pressures to, to build up a, a whole civilization. Yeah, so we kind of connect, it's showing how we connect our emotions uh, to, the, uh, to, to the, the world around us, to the yes. objects around us. It, 